Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. Whether you're joining us here or online, we are happy to have you here at CBC. Will you stand with us if you're able as we prepare our hearts for worship this morning? God, this morning we just declare that you are always worthy of praise and worship, God. This morning we realize that we are joining in with angels and all of creation as we give you praise. God, I pray that you would cause our hearts to overflow in worship regardless of anything that's going on in our life, God. No matter what goes on, Lord, you are still on the throne. You are still worthy. And so we give you our hearts this morning. We give you our attention. We give you everything that we have. Help us do that, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise Hi. 
Let's praise the Lord. to that song. I think it's so powerful, reminding ourselves of God's faithfulness and his faithfulness in the future will continue because he's proven himself faithful time and time again. I keep thinking about something that um, Pastor Bob said last week. He was talking about kind of how we will automatically do whatever the person we love wants us to do because of our love for them, not because we like have to do something. But he was kind of giving an example last week and it was sort of amusing even at the baptism right afterwards. Um, my husband like hates pools. Like he will, I don't think I've ever gotten him to go in a pool, but all of a sudden my son, you know, who like adores my husband and they just have this special, like super special bond. He's, my son just looking at the pool and he's looking at the slide and he just wants to go in so bad. And all of a sudden my husband's like, doesn't even have a bathing suit, doesn't have anything, but he's just like, we're going in the pool. I'm like, and he spends like the next like hour and a half in the pool with my son just because he loves him that much. And what does it look like for us to not just follow God because like we have things we need to do and how easy it is for us to fall into sort 
sort of like, oh, Christianity is like behavior modification. I should do this. I shouldn't do that. I should read my Bible. I should go to church. I should help those people because that's what Christians do versus like, no, I want to read my Bible. I want to worship. I want to help those people because I'm so in love with who God is and I've seen his goodness time and time again. And I just encourage us right now, it's so easy to fall into that, to just kind of check our own hearts and be like, am I doing things just because that's what I'm supposed to do? Or am I doing this because my love for God is so strong that I would do anything to follow after him? So let's check our hearts this morning. Let's surrender our love and our affection to Jesus. Amen.
I just pray that you would take us back to that, oh Lord, for that even for the first time. That God, if it's been a long since, time since we've just sat at your feet just to adore you, just to love you, Lord, to follow you. God, remind us again to come back to a relationship with you, Lord. Remind us that it doesn't matter how many good things we do. It doesn't matter how many times we read our Bible even if it is just to check a box. God, bring us back to a relationship with you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, worship team. Hey, you guys, I'm Pastor Dave. If you don't know me, please get to know me anytime. Uh, I want to welcome you if you're a first-time guest to CBC. Uh, we love having you here. And I know you're not a hooting and hollering church, but this next statement you guys should hoot and holler for and get an amen about. Our vision is all about inviting people to follow Jesus to impact our community and the world around us. Amen. Amen. I love that we get to invite people into our lives so that we can go out and affect other people's lives. And if you guys haven't had the opportunity to invite someone even in this church to get to know you on a personal level so that you guys can unify to go impact our community, now's the time to do it. It's never too late to get to know someone that you've seen for years but never got to know. I'm excited about what this next year has for us, and I'm excited about how we're going to get to partner. One of the ways that we're partnering right now is through Food Share. If you guys are already serving in Food Share, you guys should give yourselves a pat on the back because it is a phenomenal ministry that's been growing exponentially every single time that we do it. And I want to point out that the next Food Share is next Saturday, and please still bring donations. There's a lot of people in need right now, and we're a place where people are getting that need met. And so that's an exciting thing. That's one of the ways that we're impacting our community. The second thing I want to point out for you guys today is today's Communion Sunday. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I know we're not hooting and hollering, but it's Communion Sunday. We get to express our faith to everyone around us through taking the bread and the cup. And so I, a, I encourage you guys, if you guys are a follower of Christ, to go grab a little cup and a cracker. And if you're not a follower of Christ, Pastor Bob will, will introduce you today. It's never too late. He'll introduce you right now. So communion cups are right back there, right behind Kelsey. And third thing, today is the first Sunday that kids and students are going to be off for their services. So if you're a kid, your awesome teachers are going to be waving their hands over there. You're going to go with them. And parents, pick them up in the corner back there uh, when church is over. Students, grab a communion cup on your way out. We're going to do that together in the front patio. And you can follow Audrey and Brenna and Kane. Say hi, Audrey, Brenna, Kane. And we can follow us out to the front patio so we can do a lesson together. Awesome. You guys mind if I pray for you real quick? No? You're not a hooting and hollering church. That's okay. I'll take that as a yes. Lord Jesus, thank you for, uh, thank you for this church. Thank you, Jesus, that we have the opportunity to invite others to be followers of you so that we can impact our local community and the world around us. And Jesus, we are so grateful for every opportunity and every ministry that you've put on the lives of the the people of this church to do that vision and that mission. Lord, I pray that today people are able to introduce themselves to new faces, make new friends, and continually unify together to, to fulfill that common mission. Lord, I pray for Pastor Bob today, and I thank you for the word that the kids are going to receive, the students are going to receive, and all of us as adults are going to receive. Lord, thank you for speaking through uh, the people that you've put in this church. Thank you, Lord, for speaking through Pastor Bob, and thank you, Lord, for this ministry. Pray this all in Jesus' name. We all said amen. amen. I love it. Hey, is it awesome to have Dave and Audrey here or what? Yeah. As David said, right after uh, the sermon, we're going to go right into communion. And since things don't get passed out, you'll already have it. The bread and juice are together. It goes rather quick. So you want to grab that now and feel free to do that during the sermon. It's not a distraction to me. Although if I seem distracted today, it's because Satan has incarnated himself in the form of two flies that keep buzzing around my face and landing on my legs and it's driving me nuts. So if you could just pray for him to be gone, that would be great. We are talking today about what it means to support one another. We've been going through this series in the New Testament of all the one another commands. And we started out with the command that we are to esteem and to regard one another, which in the original language literally means to cherish, to hold dearly. 
From there, we moved on to the principle and the command that we are to love one another, which is repeated throughout the Bible and throughout the New Testament. And when Peter talked about that, he said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, the end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Most of all, continue to show deep love, fervent love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. And we talked about how that word in the original means to stretch out the hands. What does it mean to love others sacrificially, even when it's inconvenient, even when it costs us? Last week, we talked about forgiving and confessing our sins and the value in, in living as people of honesty and transparency, living authentically. Paul said in Ephesians 4, get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and harsh words and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. And we talked about the fact that it's through confession that we get rid of those and we release those to God so that he can change us and take care of that. And instead, we're to be kind-hearted to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another just as God through Christ has forgiven us. So every time we see that Jesus is our model, Jesus is the one who has lived it and modeled it for us that we might follow his example. And today we're talking about supporting one another. And we're going to begin in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 24. It's the image of the body that Paul talks a lot about how there are different parts of the body, but they all have one purpose, and that's unity and for the good of the body. And God has given us different gifts and abilities as his children and how he uses us. So 1 Corinthians 12 Verse 24, you can read along or you can listen as I read. Paul says, But God has so composed the body, giving extra honor to that member which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care or concern for one another. Remember that, the same care or concern for one another. We're going to come back to that. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. That word care or take notice uh, goes to a Greek word that means to take thought. And really, I, I believe the first thing we need to do in supporting one another is to consider Consider others. That's number one of the outline if you're doing the fill-in. Supporting each other starts and begins with us noticing and caring, taking thought of, engaging others. Before we can be of any assistance in any way at all, we really need to have other people on our radar. We can't be so self-absorbed that we don't even notice other people. I like one commentator said that, Considering others doesn't mean just tolerating them. We're not talking about just dealing with people or, you know, the bare minimum. Considering means attempting to see things from the other person's perspective. Considering their needs, spoken and unspoken. We studied in recent weeks that passage in Philippians 2, and it's, it's called the kenotic passage because the Greek word for emptying is the word kenosis. Jesus Christ, although he was God, came in the form of human flesh. And in doing so, he emptied himself of all of his divine prerogatives, meaning that he never used his divine powers to ease his human condition, but purely for the benefit and the needs of others. And in that passage, Paul says in Philippians 2 verse 4, don't merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Considering means that we can't be so self-absorbed that we can't see beyond our own nose or beyond our own interests, beyond our own activities. It necessitates that we look and see beyond ourselves, that we listen, that we truly listen. You've all been around those people what when you're talking to them, you, you, you can tell they're just waiting for a break in the conversation. They're just waiting for airspace that they can jump in and take it off and start talking about you know, everything that they're involved in and doing. And, and you're always coming away from those kind of conversations feeling like that person just doesn't even listen. I could be saying anything and they'd just be nodding their head and waiting for dead space that they can jump in. 
And, and, and none of us feel valued or appreciated when we are around people like that. We never really feel like they're empathizing with us, that they're putting themselves in our position or in our shoes. But this is how we have the same care for one another. It's exactly what Jesus talked about in the Gospels repeatedly when he said that the, first, the, the two most important commandments that sum up the greater Ten Commandments are you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And second, he said, like that, we are to love our neighbor as ourselves because everyone takes care of themselves. Most healthy people do, and we are to love other people the way that we want to be loved and taken care of. I was reading a, uh, an article this week by a guy named Sky Jathani, and he was writing an article called Why I Don't Tweet. <laughs> He said, explaining why he doesn't Twitter, author and editor Sky Jathani writes, I know I'll get grief for this, but in the 2004 film, Shall We Dance, one character had a really insightful bit of dialogue. He said, we need a witness to our lives. There are billions of people on the planet. I mean, what does any one life really mean? But in a marriage, you're promising to care about everything, the good things, the bad things, the terrible things, the mundane things, all of it, all of the time, every day. You're saying your life will not go unnoticed, will never go unnoticed because I will notice it. Your life will not go unwitnessed because I will be your witness. We all want our lives to matter. And we believe that they only matter if they are noticed by someone else. I wonder if this is the desire for a witness, if, if, is it, if this isn't the desire that fuels a lot of blogs, Facebook, and especially Twitter. We want someone, anyone, to take notice, to care about us, to watch us, and by their attention, communicate to us that we matter and that we have value, that our life counts. This is one of the hidden motivations behind Twittering, and I think it is that what we're really talking about is spiritual hunger, one that I don't believe can be satisfied online. Perhaps the most significant reason I don't Twitter, this is Jeff, not me talking, is because I already have a witness for my life. Psalm 139 says it best. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is even on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. He finishes by saying, I believe in God's economy. There is not a single thought, feeling, or moment that is lost. There is nothing that is unseen or unrecorded. God is indeed with me and witnessing every thought and reflection. My ideas are not lost and my life really does matter. Not because someone read it or heard it or saw it or tweeted it, but because God is my witness. Friends, that so beautifully sums up what we're talking about today. We all have needs and we all desire to connect with others. We all desire to feel valued. And, and part of valuing each other is to take notice of each other. And hopefully we're doing that the same way that God has taken notice of us. We're reaching out to others in the same way that he has reached out to us. Paul goes on in Romans chapter 14, verse 1, to say, Now accept the one who is weak in the faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions or on their opinions. And then a chapter later in Romans 15, 7, Paul says, Therefore accept one another, just as Christ has also accepted us to the glory of God. So after we take notice of others, we need to accept them. It's one thing to, to take notice, to be concerned, to, to recognize somebody and affirm their presence. It's a, it's a next step to accept them. And I love that word because in the original language, it means to continually take to oneself, to continually draw to oneself. The, the image that came to me this week is when, when my girls were growing up, when there were times where, you know, they fell down or they hurt themselves as a parent, you just, you take them and you gather them in your arms and you just, you hold them close. You take them to yourself or perhaps after you had to discipline them or, or correct them. 
that showing that you still love them, that that love is unchanged, is unconditioned, unconditional, and you take them to yourselves. Maybe it's a time of grieving and you're at a funeral or a memorial or you're with somebody who's gone through a tremendous loss and you understand that at that moment, words are just so cheap. They fall so short. And the best thing you can do is just hold them. You know, that was the best thing that Job's friends did is when they just sat in dust and ashes with him for a week or whatever it was, eight days, 10 days, and just didn't say a word. It was when they opened their mouths when Job was like, oh gosh, could we have just ended when you identified with me? But sometimes the best thing we can do is just take someone to ourselves. And I love the original language that all of these commands are in the present active tense, which means to continually do it. That it's not a once and done, it's an ongoing action that we are to do. To accept others is to draw or to take others continually to ourselves. And Paul quickly says that we don't do that for the purpose of passing judgment on them. Meaning we don't welcome people into our gathering and into our fellowship (coughs) with the intent (coughs) of changing their views or opinions by arguing with them. We believe that God does that. We, we, we are not the Holy Spirit. It's not our job or role to fix people or change people. It's our job to love people. And God does the transformative work. But we don't invite people in with the intention of changing them and arguing with them. Again, we all have gone through experiences where we felt like someone was nice to us or someone included us or someone reached out to us. And then... Shortly after that, we find out that it came with an agenda of what they wanted us to do or who they wanted us to be, you know? Maybe it was a dating relationship and you realized, oh, this person will love me if I become this kind of person or act this kind of way. They they just want me to be what they want me to be. And we don't feel truly feel loved for who we are. The historical context of what Paul was addressing is that There seemed to have been a temporary and local problem in the Roman church, but it's also a problem that continually confronts the church even today. In in the church at Rome, there were apparently two lines of thought. There were some who believed that in Christian liberty, the old taboos, the old laws and observances were irrelevant, that they no longer had to rigidly observe days and festivals and feasts. And Paul makes it clear that this is the real Christian faith. On the other hand, there were those who believed that it was wrong to eat certain meats and who strictly observed certain laws and customs like circumcision, among other things. And Paul describes this ultra-scrupulous person as weak in the faith for, for two reasons. Boils down to two things. Number one, they haven't truly discovered the nature and the essence of Christian freedom. They're still living like legalists. Christianity for them still consists of rules and regulations. And secondly, they're still living as if salvation is by works. They believe that they can gain God's favor by doing certain things and abstaining from other things. Basically, they're still trying to earn a right relationship with God. They haven't accepted grace. They're thinking more of what they can do for God than what God has already done for them. And friends, that's the nature that we, we keep on drilling in week after week. What sets Christianity apart from every other religion on the face of the earth is that religion says do, do this, do that, and maybe you can earn God's favor. Maybe you can have peace with him. Maybe you can have forgiveness. But Christianity isn't about do, do, do. It's about what's already been done for us through Jesus Christ, a free gift through grace that equals God's righteousness. That's what it's all about, short and sweet. So after we take notice of others, after we consider their needs, we are to accept them. We are continually to take them to ourselves, to draw them into ourselves, to treat them like family, like those that we cherish. And finally, We are to bear and to share their burdens. Notice, it doesn't say bear with, again, like tolerate them. Just get along. Just, you know, there's not that much longer on this earth and soon we'll be with the Lord in glory, so just bear with it. No, 
It's not that image at all. It's to, to bear their burdens, to carry and share their loads. And the first passage that I want to look at for this is in Romans 15. In Romans 15, verse 1, Paul says, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength, and not just to please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for their good and for their edification. For even Christ did not come to please himself. As it is written, the insults of those who insulted you fell on me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and endurance grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he closes with this, Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. We are to take notice of others. We are to accept them. And then we are to bear, to bear one another's burdens. Paul says, we who are strong, meaning we who are strong in convictions and conscience, ought, and that word ought is in the present tense again, so continually emphasizing the ongoing obligation. And, and it's interesting, in, in foreign languages, they emphasize something by putting it at the beginning of the sentence. So even though it reads awkwardly, this whole you know, considering and, and, and accepting others is at the front of the sentence in the Greek construction. And we are to bear the weakness of, of those. The strong are not to despise the weak, but they are to bear and shoulder their burdens. The strong are not to seek to please themselves, but rather they are to seek to please others for their good to build them up. And that's exactly what Paul talked about in Romans 14, just a chapter before. Romans 14, 19, Paul said, So then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. It's that body imagery again. What do we pursue? We pursue the things that lead to unity. We pursue the things that lead to the edification of others, to making them stronger, to fortifying them to lifting their spirits. That's what we pursue as a Christian community. And notice what Paul says about the purpose and the ministry of Scripture in this process of helping us with this challenge. He says, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. The Scriptures served to give us endurance. That word in the original language means steadfastness in the face of adversity steadfastness in the face of adversity. Scripture gives us endurance and encouragement so that we might have hope. And again, that so that we might have hope is in the present tense, so that we might continually have hope that continues and goes on and on and on, not fleeting hope that's here for a moment and then gone and it's elusive and we can't catch it again, but hope that remains and lives with us because the person of God lives within us through a relationship with Jesus. And as we learn from our past and the lives of those who are recorded in Scripture, we're motivated to endure, to be comforted in the present, and to look ahead down the road with hope and confidence to the future because of what God has done for us. And, and, and please understand, when we talk about Christian hope, we're not talking about some immature shallow, overly optimistic hope that, that hopes because it doesn't know any better, that hopes because it hasn't experienced real life or because it's never dealt with tragedy or adversity. No, quite the opposite. Christian hope has seen everything and has endured everything and still has not despaired because it's rooted in the nature and the power of God. It's rooted in the nature and the power of God. I love that passage in Corinthians where Paul says, you know, we're oppressed, we're struck down, we're, we're beaten, we're this, we're that, but we're not despairing, we're not crushed because God is at work within us. And so 
Christians are not those who just kind of skate through life without any problems because God looks out for them. No, Christians go through the same stuff that everybody else goes through, but we go through it with a different power source and a different hope, one that's rooted in God. It's not hope in the human spirit or in human goodness or in human achievement. That's what our world would lead us to believe. But rather it's hope that's rooted, as I said, in the power and the nature of God. One last passage I want to look at about our obligation and privilege to bear the burdens of others. And that's in Galatians 6. Galatians 6, 1 to 5. You can turn there or you can, you can look. Galatians 6 told you before, I always remember Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, go everywhere preaching Christ, kind of that acronym, or go eat popcorn, whatever works for you. Galatians 6, brothers and sisters, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks that he is something when he is nothing, he deceives only himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. For each one will bear his own load. Part of what Paul says here about bearing the burdens of others is that we do so with the purpose and the goal of restoring them, restoring them. I love this word, this original word here was used in secular Greek to speak of a surgeon who would remove a mass or, or a, a, a cancerous object from a body. Or it was also used of a surgeon who would, who would set a broken bone and put it back into place so that it might heal. That's the image of what it means to restore a person in a spirit of love, that we are, we are setting them in order to be healthy and to grow again. And we don't do that condescendingly, like, oh, I, I got my act together, now I'm going to help you. We draw alongside of them. You know, we, we were talking about this at men's Bible study on Friday morning. It's kind of like saying, hey, man, I need to go to Weight Watchers. You want to go with me? I'm not like the exercise coach, and I'm going to get you into shape, and I'm coming play, from a place of superiority. But it's when we enter into things with others, in solidarity. Hey man, I struggle with this too. I have an issue with this too. You want to you want to do this together? You want to be each other's accountability and support? That's what it means to restore in love and not from a a perceived place of perfection or superiority. And the whole tone of the word lays the stress not on the punishment but on the cure. The correction and restoration is thought of not as a penalty so much as it's thought about putting something right again, making something right again, restoring it. And notice how Paul says in this passage and in other passages, we are to do so remembering there but by the grace of God go I. Like you may be struggling right now in this moment with this issue or that issue, and I must never think that, oh, you know, it stinks to be you. Thank goodness that's not my issue because I could very easily struggle with that too. And we should never come from a place of pride where we feel, you know, invincible and that we're not vulnerable to the same things. Paul says, there but by the grace of God go I. It's also interesting to note in this passage that when Paul speaks about bearing each other's burdens, he uses two different Greek words. You might have noticed that in the passage that we are to, to bear one another's burdens and there, thereby fulfill the law of Christ. But then he ends in verse 5 by saying, each one will bear his own load. Like, which one is it? Deal with your own burden and your own load or help others? Well, it's both. The first word that he uses in verse 2 speaks of a heavy, crushing load. In the context, it's related to temptation and spiritual warfare as we see And it's more than any person can carry by themselves. And we are to come alongside of people in that that situation and help them bear the load that they're, they're carrying, to help them with a solution. And this is fulfilling the law of Christ to help anyone who is carrying such a burden. 
This is exactly why Jesus blasted, blasted the religious leaders of his day. Now, uh, Luke chapter 11, Jesus said, Woe to you, you, you religious spiritual leaders, for you weigh people down. Literally, you crush them with burdens hard to bear, while you yourselves will not even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Jesus is saying you put unbearable burdens upon others, and you're not even living that way. And you won't even lift a finger to help them. Jesus' harshest and meanest words in all the Bible went to those who should have been offering help to others, shepherding others, and yet they just promoted an unbearable standard that they hypocritically weren't even living to themselves. Those who were called to help bear the burdens of others weren't modeling it at all. Well, the second word that he uses in verse 5 is a word that is used for a soldier's pack, the pack that a soldier would walk around with. And everybody had their own pack. You didn't expect somebody else to carry your pack for you, although it also says in Scripture, if one of those Roman soldiers comes up to you and asks you to carry their pack for a mile, carry it two miles. Go above and beyond. But it was understood that each person had their own load and their own burden to carry. And it's not speaking about that. And Jesus reminds us in the Gospels that his load and his burden, very same word, is light. His yoke is easy. Come to me, all of you who are weary and overburdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, in closing, I love how Matthew reminds us in chapter 8 and verse 17 of his gospel. He quotes from the words of the prophet Isaiah. And he's speaking of Jesus. Matthew 8, 17, he says, He himself took on himself our infirmities and he bore our diseases. And guess what? It's that same word. It's that same word that we are commanded to bear the burdens of others. Because Jesus himself bore in his flesh, in his body, the weight of our sin, the weight of everything that we were struggling with. Friends, this is the essence of the gospel, that Jesus has borne upon himself what you and I could never bear ourselves and what we could never bear on behalf of others. He has already borne it for us. And that's exactly, precisely why we need a Savior. One of my favorite verses you've heard me quoted over and over again, especially as it relates to communion, is 2 Corinthians 5.21. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Friends, Jesus has borne himself our burden, the burden of our sin, past, present, and future. Your sin will never come as a surprise to God. He's already seen it. He's already paid for it. Your responsibility is to receive his grace and forgiveness as a gift. You can spend your life saying, thank you, God. Thank you so much. Or you can spend your life saying, I don't need it. Thanks. That was nice. Great you died on the cross, but not really for me. Maybe for others, but not for me. I'm, I'm doing all right. But we all one day will face our maker and our creator. And the only way to live in his presence forever is to accept what he has offered. And that's really the essence of communion. As you take your cup, as you remember last time, the bread is on top, the juice is below. Communion is symbolic of the newness of life that we have through Christ. How he on the cross bore our sins in his body. He bore the weight of the penalty, the consequences of our sin. And that's why on that last night with his disciples at the Last Supper, he said, this is my body, which is given for you and for your sins. Take and eat in remembrance of me. Take and eat. Lord Jesus, we thank you that your payment for sin, your, your life in exchange for ours is enough. It is sufficient. It is that once and for all sacrifice that pays the penalty for our sins. In the same way scripture says Jesus took the cup and he said this juice, this wine represents my blood which was shed 
Scripture makes it clear that there's no forgiveness of sins apart from the shedding of blood. And not just any blood, but the blood of a perfect, unblemished sacrifice. And Jesus is that sacrifice. Scripture says he is the Lamb of God that is slain for the sins of the world. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave himself, he gave Jesus. In the very next verse, for God did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might live. Take and drink in remembrance. Lord God, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we thank you that you have forgiven our sins. You have removed them as far as the east is from the west. You have chosen to remember them no more. They are no longer counted against us. When you look at us, we are seen as pure and righteous, not because of our deeds, but because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. And we can face the future with confidence and hope. And we can have the strength to look beyond ourselves and our own needs and even care for others because your energizing spirit indwells us. And we know that we will forever be united with you, never again separated from you. We thank you for this. Lord God, as we give back to you today, either physically here at church or online or through the mobile app, we thank you that you've invited us to partner with you in your kingdom work. And we thank you that as you multiplied the the loaves and the fish, you have the ability to multiply our resources, our humble resources for your glory and for your kingdom. And so we pray expectantly now, thanking you that you will use our meager gifts to meet the needs in the ministries of this church and those that we support around the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. is under fire Now the way when the walls are closing When I look at the space between where we used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be Was another
the cross they bear the burden. Will another die for me? And there's a grave that holds nobody. Now that power is in me. God, we thank you for that incredible truth. Lord, there is nothing that we could go through that would cause us to crumble if we fall upon you, Lord, if we trust in you. And God, when it comes to people around us, Lord, you give us strength, not just for our own burdens, but for those around us as well, Lord. Would you empower us to see, Lord, empower us to see the burdens of those around us and bear them in the same way that you've done, God. We want to live out your mission here on this earth, Lord. We want to do things the way that you call us to do. So God, give us the strength. Remind us that you are stronger than anything that could come our way. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us this week. We hope to see you next week here or on the live feed. And we hope you have a great week.